Hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. We're here still, or once again, in West Tewakini, Texas, outside of Dallas, continuing on in our visit here. And we're just blessed that you can join us so we can be together again in God's Word, God's wonderful, wonderful Word. So on behalf of Alice and myself, I want to greet you in the name of yes. our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and pray that all of us will be blessed by his word. Because that's what he desires to happen. Absolutely. We'll be blessed in his word. We're continuing on in our look at the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, now we're in Matthew 10, 5, 10 rather. Mm -hmm. Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12 today. All right. Are you ready? Okay. Ready. You have your Bibles at hand. You have some paper and pencil to write with. Mm -hmm. Make notes. Yep. And remember what I said before. Test everything that you hear yes. here. Yes. Um, we need to examine all things and hold fast to that which is good. I'm human. Hello. Our Lord God and the Spirit of God are not. That's right. And it, it is up to them. That God sent the Holy Spirit to, to bring us eyes. all, to lead us all into truth. Yes. So we need to hear from the Lord. Uh, you know, I, my... my job, so to speak, as a teacher is to encourage us to get us into the Word, that we would have conversations with the Lord, that we'd hear from God. Because faith comes by hearing, but hearing by the Word of God. Okay? Yes. All right. As I say, we're picking up where we, we left off last week in uh, Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers. Okay? For they shall be called the sons of God. And now we're in Matthew 5, 10. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. 5, 10 to 12, right? Isn't it interesting because we're kind of coming full circle in the Beatitudes where it started, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they... So what? Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And now at the end of the Beatitudes, again, it's theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. It kind of closes them all together because it's not like you can pick and choose which one of the Beatitudes you want working mm -hmm. in your life. You need them all. You need them all or none, you know? So that's where we are. But this is about that glorious promise of God. And we'll talk about it being a promise. Persecution. Mm -hmm. Blessed are those who have been persecuted. You know, back in the 1500s, 1563, there was a book published. Its title is actually The Acts and Monuments. It's known better as Fox's Book of Martyrs. It's a gigantic work, of about 1,800 pages when it was written. And it's about church history and the martyrs of the church. It was written in a time when the people of God in the Western world were highly conscious of the reality of persecution, okay? Mm -hmm. Today, although persecution is probably more widespread than ever before, Christians in the West tend generally to be blissfully unaware of or untouched by the sacrifices being made by faithful brothers and sisters around the world. The Lord, however, is not. He is not unaware. Not at all. Okay? So the first thing we have to do is understand persecution, okay? A lot of people have an idea. Persecution is not that you have a bumper sticker on your car saying, honk if you love Jesus, and somebody laughs at you. That's not persecution. That's not what we're talking about here. So there's a lot of strife all around the world today. My goodness gracious, it's hard to, I mean, contain it. It can fill dozens of 24-hour-a-day news channels. There's so much going on in the world around us. So there's a lot of strife all around the world that would rightly qualify as persecution based on things like, like race, 
on nationality, what tribe you come from, uh, political or social affiliations, economic status, even religion, which is what's going to concern us most, I guess, because we live in a world that is filled with hate, that has rejected God's love. Jesus wrote, after the death, the burial, and the resurrection, I mean, John, John wrote, after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he said, we know that we are of God and that the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one, all right? Um, other translations, they don't say, they don't say sway, they say power or control. So like under the control or the power of the, of the wicked one. We're talking, we're talking about the devil himself, the father of lies, a liar by nature and the father of lies. So that's the root of true persecution. Mm -hmm. While the people are focused on worldly divisions that cause persecu persecution of one group by another, Satan's focus is on those who are righteous. Yes. Isn't that what they said? Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, righteousness, for sure, that's that right relationship that we have with God the Father through the atoning work of Jesus Christ. But it's not so much about what you do, this persecution, as who you are. The children of God. Yes. That's what we studied the last time, right? The peacemakers. Sons Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. It's about our relationship with God. That's what Satan hates. That's what Satan hates. Is he hates us because of our relationship with God. So the, the persecution that Jesus speaks of here is the devil's attempt to remove by action or by threat of action the influence of Christians in the world. Mm -hmm. All right? He attempts to do this by trying to stop us from living a Christian I was going to say a Christian, but it's a Christ-imitating, spirit-led life. And he does this by either getting us to surrender our commitment to the Lord, drawing us back into the world, mm -hmm. or discrediting us so we're perceived as not living that life, or just stop us from living. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what, first, that's what true persecution is about, right? Putting an end to you. But I want you to know that it's, it's not about our, it's not so much about our good works as it is that our influence is the presence of Jesus Christ. You know, Satan, he's like the prince of darkness. He, he hates, he hates the light. But it says that Jesus, who is the light of the world, came into the world and men did not receive him because they loved the darkness. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes. So we are, as Jesus will go on to say after the Beatitudes, we are. We're the light of the world. We're the salt of the earth, right? That's the influence of Jesus, the presence of Jesus Christ. Because Paul wrote to the Corinthians and he said this, But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. And then he goes on to say, in, well, he said, first of all, in 1 Corinthians, Do you not know that you are a temple of God? and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. It is the presence of Jesus, or His Spirit, that always upsets the demons. Okay? It really isn't about us, at least until you get a reputation for always being with Him. Okay? <laughs> he doesn't like, he doesn't like, you know, I, I, I don't want to get distracted, but I think about how many times I've encountered people who have ministries to, to cast demons out of Christians yes. and talk about how we should be afraid of demons. Mm -mm. I want to tell you something. When you are walking in the Spirit, led by the Spirit of God, led by the Word of God, the demons will be afraid of you. Right. They all flee. They all flee. It says, you know, we're to humble ourselves. We're to, we're to resist Him, and He'll flee. Mm -hmm. Submit to God. Humble ourselves. Submit to God, and Satan will flee. You know the story of the seven sons of Sceva in the book of Acts? He was, Sceva was a Jewish priest. Mm -hmm. And his, these sons of his, they encountered a man who was possessed by a demon in Ephesus. That's, this is in Acts 19. So they tried to cast the demon out. But the evil spirit answered them and said, Jesus I know. 
Paul I recognize or I know about, but who are you? And he proceeded to beat them silly, really badly. And not for their righteousness either, okay? What does he mean? Jesus, the, the demons are fallen angels. Before the heavens and earth were, were, were created, these angels knew Jesus Christ. Yes. And I love this line, Paul I recognize, or Paul I know about. How do they know about Paul? How do these demons know about Paul? His reputation. By his reputation. You know why? Because the demons were running around saying, oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. telling, they're telling their demon friends. Look out for that. You better, if you run across that Paul, you better watch out. When Jesus encountered demons, did Jesus shake or did the demons shake? You carry that same Holy Spirit within you, right? And this persecution is for the sake of righteousness. For what credit is there, Peter wrote, if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience, but if when you do it is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. If you do something wrong and you, you're punished for it, that's not persecution. Okay? Are we clear on that? It's for righteousness. And then, you know, Peter goes on to say, and he says, but even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you're blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right that, rather than for doing what is wrong. We're going to, you know, do you believe the Bible? How many of you believe these are the last, truly the last days? I got one here on my, on my side, yes. But Paul wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Talking about the last days, the perilous last days. And he said, all who desire to live godly will be persecuted. That's the word of God. Yes. And the word of God can't be broken. Mm -hmm. So we're going to face persecution. You know what? He also says, give thanks in all things. For this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Regardless of what's going on in your life, we need to be a people of thanksgiving. Because God causes all things things to work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Okay, I'm going to go astray one more time here, but it's not astray, of course. You know, just let me go through this real quickly here. Our names, those of us who are the saved, mm -hmm. the saints of God, mm -hmm. our names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life from before the foundation of the earth. Yes. Long before you cried out to God long before you accepted Jesus Christ here as your Lord and your Savior. Long before that, your name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Mm -hmm. God knew, okay? And you were predestined to be conformed into the image of His Son, Christ Jesus. But you weren't always saved. So you received the Word. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because it says, those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how will they call upon the name of the Lord? If they don't know. And how are they going to know about it if they've not heard it? And how are they going to hear it if it's not preached? And how are they? How is it going to be preached if somebody's not saved? So I want to tell you, there's an account, which I, you're probably familiar with, in Acts chapter 16, about Paul and Silas being in Philippi. All right? And as unjustly as ever happened, they were arrested, beaten, and thrown into a deep, dark prison. Yes. That's persecution. Yes, it, is. it was for the sake of righteousness. They had not done anything wrong whatsoever, right? Yes, so they're thrown in. I'm sure, like I said, you know this account. They're thrown into this deep, dark prison. And around, around midnight, it says, Paul and Silas, you know what they're doing? They're praying. They're singing praises to God. Mm -hmm. Because we're supposed to be a people of praise. Regardless of our circumstance, we're supposed to be praising him, giving him thanks in all things, right? Well, you know, Jesus said that if, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. So if Paul and Silas were confessing Jesus, there in the depths of that horrible, miserable prison, 
Jesus Christ stood in the land of glory, confessing Paul and Silas to the Father. And Jesus must have been saying, Father, do you see my servant Paul? Do you see my servant Silas? Look at them. There they are in the midst of that, and they're praising me. And you know what happened? The angels got excited. Because when Jesus gets excited, the angels are going to get excited. So they started hopping around all over heaven. And hallelujah, heaven shook. And when heaven shook, the earth shook. Hallelujah. And when earth shook, pow, the gates of the prison flew open. All of the cells flew open. The chains on Paul and Silas broke and fell onto the ground. You know this account? Oh, what a time that must have been. So there was a jailer there, a Roman jailer. And he sees all of a sudden all these prisoners are set free. And he knows he's responsible. If they're not there, he dies. So he said to Paul, what must I do to be saved? Now, why do you think he said that to Paul? Because he saw in Paul and Silas something he had never seen before. Especially He's, in that prison. In that place, in that prison, mm. it was a place of utter, absolute misery. And here, for the first time, he sees men praising mm. God. Giving thanks, in the midst, and giving thanks in the midst yeah. of it. That's why he asked Paul. Because he saw in Paul something he had never seen before. So he says to Paul, what must I do to be saved? And Paul says to him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved and your household. So this is a wonderful story about Paul and Silas. No, it's actually a story about the jailer. Mm -hmm. You see, because that jailer, his name had been written in the Lamb's Book of Life from before the foundations of the earth. But he had to hear the gospel. Yes. He had to hear the good news. He had to receive the message. So God said, remember this, the account in, in Isaiah? God's in there and he says, who can I send? And Isaiah is saying, send me. Here I am. Here am I. Send me. Well, you know what? Paul had that same willing spirit. That's what his heart was crying out. If there was a need, a mission to be done, Paul is there and his heart is cried out, send me. So God sent Paul. God sent Silas. And they brought the peace of God. They brought the light into the darkness. And, it, and a man and his family were saved because of that. All things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. What, what price are you willing to pay that somebody would see the glory of God in your life? Praise you, Jesus. You know, you can avoid persecution. I'm convinced of it. I'm, I'm convinced that Christians can avoid persecution. I know a little bit about snakes. Now, Alice and I grew up in New York City and it's environs. Yes. And there's not a problem with snakes there by and large. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I, I flew as an air crewman in the Navy. I've been through a lot of survival schools. Alice and I lived in the jungle. Mm -hmm. So I know this. Generally speaking, since humans are not a food source for snakes, right? We're a little too big for the average snake. Right. Right? If you leave them alone, they'll leave you alone. Yes. Okay? They won't strike you. They won't bother you mm -hmm. until they feel threatened. All right? The thing is, Jesus said, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. Luke 10, 19. You go stomp on a serpent today. God's given you authority. He's given you the power to tread on serpents. But when you do, don't be surprised that they strike. That's right. If Satan can get you to the place where you'll compromise and stop being a threat to him, maybe he'll leave you alone. Think about, you know, one of the most famous encounters of godly versus not godly. What do you think? I was thinking of, oh, maybe I'd stop Carmel. Carmel, that's good. Carmel. But I was thinking of David and Goliath. Oh, yes. yes. I was thinking of David and Goliath. And if you look at this in the natural, okay, and that's uh, part of the idea. You got little David, little young David, and you got this monstrous warrior, Goliath. Yes, yes. David goes out on the battlefield. Okay, here's a young, and it says, it literally, it says that when Goliath saw David, he disdained him. He had no regard whatsoever. He thought nothing of, of David when he saw him coming. You know, what are you kidding me? He wasn't concerned at all, but... Then David said to the Philistine, it says in 1 Samuel 17, You come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, 
the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. It was then that Goliath knew he was in for a fight. He was in for a battle. And it says that he rose. He'd been sitting down. Right? He'd he been completely he unconcerned. I mean, he had been challenging the entire army of God. And they, they didn't respond until along came young David. All right? So he wasn't concerned at all when he saw David until David said to him, I come to you in the name of the Lord. He got up. So he got up. And then he went down. Yes, he did. Forever. Hallelujah. Because Forever. I'll tell you what, God responds to faith. God yes. responds to us walking in the power of his spirit, in the Trust power him. of his name. Yes. The passage ends with a reminder that the prophets of old were persecuted in the same way. We're talking about this persecution, right? Mm -hmm. And for the same reason. They brought God's presence and his word. And that's the power that Satan fears. So don't take it personally. Don't take it personally. And don't be concerned when you're persecuted. Be concerned when you are not. Right. Maybe you're not a threat. Yeah. Now that may sound silly, but think about it. Not stepping on it. Yeah. If Satan's not if Satan's not bothering you, maybe it's because you're not bothering him. Okay. And this is also a good place to take note of the fact that while men may be the agents of persecution, Satan is the author. Okay. So, like we've noted before, it says our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness. In the heavenly places, mm -hmm. Ephesians chapter 6, 12, 6 and verse 12. If you don't keep that in mind and in your heart, you're not going to have the power or the ability to keep the Lord's command a little later on here in the Sermon on the Mount when he says, but I say to you, love your enemies mm -hmm. and pray for those who persecute you. Matthew 5, 44. So right, right, mm -hmm. just a little while on. Persecution is the promise of God. And it's, I, you know, can I say it's not his desire? It's a, it's a promise. It's in the word. You know, we, we grab the things we like in the word, but you can't pick and choose, okay? Here's what it says. Matthew 24, verses 9 through 10, Jesus said, Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. And at that time, many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And I believe that the... Holy Spirit will enable you to endure the persecution. Absolutely. If you are, if you're walking in the Holy Spirit now, yes. you'll walk in the Holy Spirit then, That's right. and you'll trust in the Holy Spirit then. That's right. You know, God spoke through the prophet Jeremiah, and He said, "You know, if you've run with the footmen and they've tired you out, how will you run with the horses? Right. If you're not being faithful in the little things today, don't expect to be faithful in the big things. Okay? Start practicing today. Be faithful in the little things." Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. Don't be surprised that the world hates you. Hated Jesus first. Indeed, in the last days, all who desire to live godly will, in Christ Jesus, will be persecuted. Persecution and or the avoidance of such persecution is not a matter of faith. In many places, I mean, it, it, you can't prevent it by faith is what I'm saying, right? I've gone to a lot of places, and we've, we've traveled around a lot of places, and I've heard it taught in some places that if you have faith, if you have faith in the Lord, the Lord will prevent anything bad, put quotes around that, bad, from happening to you. If you've been a recipient of such a message, you would do well to remember Stephen. A man, quote, full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, full of grace and power. Acts chapter 6. All right? Here was a man filled with faith, filled with the power of God. And yet he's being stoned to death. Mm -hmm. And what is his prayer? He says, Father, do not hold us against him. He was a witness of God's love. That was an opportunity for God's love mm -hmm. to be shown. And there was a young man there. Who was holding the coats of the people who were throwing rocks so they could throw them all the harder. And he heard that message of God's love. He heard Stephen say, Father, do not hold this against him. That was a seed of God's love, of God's word that was planted in his heart. 
And that seed burst forth into life when that young man, Saul of Tarsus, traveled the road to Damascus to persecute Christians. And he encountered the risen Savior. And Jesus said to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? So Stephen's purpose was to plant the seed in yes. Paul. Yes, and Paul turned the world upside down yes. in the power and love of the Word of God, right? Mm -hmm. Well, perhaps you would think of uh, James, the brother of John, mm -hmm. one of the apostles, who was put to death by Herod just to mistreat, and it says this, some who belong to the church mm -hmm. in Acts 12. Mm -hmm. He just, he just wanted, he just picking on the church. Mm -hmm. When Herod saw how that pleased the Jews, he arrested and imprisoned Peter. But the Lord sent an angel to miraculously release him from the cell while many were gathered and praying in Acts chapter 12. Why did the Lord deliver Peter and not Stephen and James? That's a trick question. Well, I was, I was thinking because of it. He didn't. Stephen. He delivered them all. <laughs> He delivered a, oh, see, that's true. Yes, yes, oh, yes, yes. that's true, she says. Yes. Because we're thinking of... The, because we Peter. think of it yes. in the natural. Yes. He delivered Stephen. He delivered James. He delivered Paul later on in his life. He, God is our deliverer. He will never leave fail you. Nor He'll never you. leave you nor that's forsake right. you, regardless of what you encounter. It's all opportunity for you to show the love of God. You see, I'm going to tell you something. The enemy, he can imitate a lot of things. If you believe in speaking in tongues, you think the enemy can't imitate that? Mm -hmm. Go stand outside a bar on a Saturday night at 2 o'clock in the morning. You'll hear all kinds of weird talk, all right? So, so the idea is that God will always protect you and deliver you. But it's our concept of delivery. It's our concept of, of delivery. being delivered. That's he right. is our deliverer. Okay. Think about this. Uh, we're getting, running out of time here. Yeah. As always, it As flies. It does. Tempest fugit. To which I say, even so come Lord Jesus. But, uh, he, Jesus taught a parable of the sower and the seed. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And he talks about how the word of God, the seed is planted in people's lives. Yes. But one of the things he said was, the one on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Mm -hmm. Yet he has no firm root in himself, right. but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises oh. because of the word, immediately he falls away. Mm -hmm. Stand firm. Yes. Stand firm in the Thank love you. and the presence Thank of God. God is a deliverer. He is a miracle working God to whom nothing is impossible. Yes. No matter what you're going through, mm -hmm. he can use that thing for his good, mm -hmm. for his glory rather, and your good. That's the promise. All things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to His promise. It'll work for your good, and more importantly, it'll work for His glory. When you face persecution, you know what you need to do? You need to be like Paul and Silas, sing, sing praises at the top of your lungs, and then give thanks that God is about to use you for the glory of His name. Your good, His glory. Most importantly, recall that it's not about us. That persecution will not remove the presence of God. When Satan tries to stop the work of God through persecution, it will always have the opposite result. And that's what we're going to talk about when we get together on the next time. So, Father, we just yes. thank you for your faithfulness. Yes. We thank you, Lord God, that you are always there, that you are that miracle-working God, working for our good and your glory. Lord, use our lives that we would be that faithful witness to your love and to your power. And lives would be turned to you. Father, I ask that in Jesus' precious name. God bless you and goodbye. Till the next time we gather. So I cherish you.